Why did James Elroy hate Cormac McCarthy? And I hate to see two of my favorite authors beefing with each other. I just want to hop in there and be like, stop the violence, please. But Elroy's critiques of McCarthy are very important because they are the typical ones that a random hater of Cormac McCarthy spews out. And if Cormac McCarthy was still alive, I would put him and James Elroy in the top 10 best living authors category. Because when you look at James Elroy's L.A. Quartet and the Underworld Trilogy and even some of the stuff he's been doing recently. He is a beautiful writer. It's obviously a totally different genre than the tip, your typical literary fiction. But Elroy was massively inspired, first of all, by Don DeLillo, especially the book Libra. And so he does have this deep passion for classic literature. But something interesting to note that Elroy, Elroy said was that he doesn't read any modern literature and he doesn't keep up with uh, contemporary politics anymore. But he did try to read some contemporary, contemporary literature and it was Cormac McCarthy. And this is what he found wrong with McCarthy. Quote, I tried to read a McCarthy book and thought, why doesn't this cocksucker use quotation marks? And first of all, I, I love, you know, the use of cocksucker here. It's like we got Joey Diaz. Hey, cocksucker, what's going on? Cormac, put down the put down the stethoscope in the microscope and smoke a J. But Elroy calls out one of Cormac's most dramatic decisions that he made throughout his entire career, which is the absence of quotation marks. And don't get me wrong, you guys. Sometimes, especially if I'm like a little bit tired or it's late at night and I'm reading and it's maybe one of his Southern novels or like kind of one of the slog novels of, that McCarthy has, I may get lost with who the hell is talking. I first read Cormac's bibliography when I was in high school and I for sure was confused a lot back then about all the dialogue. But I've been talking a lot about David Foster Wallace and the methods that he used to make you engage with the text more. And he would do things like breaking up the, uh, the narrative into a nonlinear format and all this other stuff. And McCarthy does something very similar, similarly, but he does it through this minimalist style because when McCarthy first published The Orchard Keeper, he was astonished that the editors wanted to change his book. He was like, this is absolutely perfect. There's nothing wrong with this. And his editor, who was Faulkner's editor, would send him this and be like, look, how the hell did we jump from this character to another character or jump six months of time and be like, wait, I talked about the dew on the grass and there's only dew on the grass like this in Knoxville in you know March or whatever. So a real reader will know what's happening. And even though McCarthy was eventually tamed and really started to embrace this idea of writing for the reader and even in his own revision started you know, doing this practice way before he ever sent it off with his later books like Outer Dark, Child of God, Blood Meridian. He still really embraced this idea of trying to make the reader wake up because when you remove quotation marks, what you're having making, first of all, you have to rely on good writing skill. And this is the reason Cormac doesn't like to use periods and a lot of other punctuation marks because he thinks that it's just a way for bad writers to be able to get away with more. And I honestly don't disagree with this. I used to teach at a school that sent 30 to 40 kids a year to Ivy League schools. And I don't know if they're, you know, all, they, all, all of them had crazy rich parents or just crazy parents. And I don't know if they're English tutors or previous teachers or stuff they read online about how to write the perfect college entrance exam made them just love semicolons and just endless crazy punctuation, but it was so annoying to read. I could just feel like the snootery and the snobbery like melting through the page as like I had to work my th way through this like punctuation maze where everything was technically correct, but it just didn't feel right. And then the deeper I looked at their papers, I realized they were just following this methodology to reach this kind of goal of doing well in this college entrance exam or something. But their sentence structure, their contrast, like all, you know, their actual imagination and flow, like all these things actually sucked. But they knew that if I gave them a, a C for set, you know, on their paper because they didn't have enough imagination, flow, sentence structure, that they could get mommy or daddy to go complain. And because they told, you know, they told their son Johnny that he was going to go to Harvard since four years old, then first of all, he could never get a C because that's impossible. And two, even if he did deserve it, they weren't, they were going to fight it to the end. Things would get so bad that, I mean, this is why I don't teach them anymore. Kids would get like an 83% in math class and it would be totally objective. Like they got all these papers wrong and we were told to keep everything so this could happen. So they, they would, you know, in an objective class where everything's 100% straightforward, get a, a B and their parents would take it to like the district level and claim 
that they were being picked on or the teacher was racist and the school was racist. Everything was out to get them or someone tampered with the test that the air conditioning wasn't on this day. And they would uh, threaten to sue and eventually they would 99% of the time get an A in the class and preserve the resume. And a lot of these kids, you know, continued on into college because I spent a ton of time in um, college and graduate school, just eight years slogging through academia and having to read my friends' papers and academic journals. And the overuse of punctuation is a major problem. And I don't know if you need to go as far as not using quotation marks. And a guy like Elroy, it really, I mean, when I look at his style, he does kind of have a pretty simplistic, minimalistic style, which kind of surprised me, surprises me, excuse me, because at times he's very similar to Cormac. Like, here's a quote from Elroy. America was never innocent. We popped our cherry on the boats over and looked back with no regrets. You can't ascribe our fall from grace to any single event or set of circumstances. You can't lose what you lacked at conception. And right there, we just kind of see like, you know, Cormac would say, you know, write that in a much more epic way and use crazy words and like do it honestly just way better. But they're expressing similar ideas in a very similar way. And when I think of Elroy's work, I don't think of like, you know, this insane grammatical mess or postmodern mess. And so I think Elroy maybe came into this um, reading of McCarthy with preconceived notion, notions because from what I can tell as we're about to hear from the second quote that he gives, I think he read All the Pretty Horses or The Crossing, and there's very beautiful writing in there. The beginning is very good, and in All the Pretty Horses, for sure, the dialogue isn't a problem. Sometimes in The Crossing with some of the longer conversations, it can be a problem, and that kind of leads us to question number two, which is a, a separate quote. I never read William Faulkner. I don't read modern fiction. I read Cormac McCarthy recently, and I thought it was rubbish. There were eight pages in Spanish. Can you read Spanish? I can't. And this brings up a very big point. I want you guys to comment down below about this. We'll talk. We'll have a whole video about this. But why do you think Cormac McCarthy included those Spanish lines? Because I understand that it's authentic. It's an authentic experience. He's going down there and if the people are speaking Spanish, he's going to include them speaking Spanish. But in the Spanish translated version of Cormac McCarthy, when the characters speak English, do they speak English? Then the Spanish is just untranslated. How about... In other authors, you know, you know, if you look at if you look if you reverse it, the logic actually doesn't work as well. But I guess no one really attempts to do this because it's kind of this wall that you don't break. Sometimes you see a lot of like authors, like especially in like critical theory and philosophy, like quoting Latin and never giving it any explanation, like Derrida and Foucault and Heidegger. Like sometimes you're reading a Paul de Man and they and they act like you should know this and or or they say something in French, like and th and then it's been translated to English and they leave it untranslated in French or Latin and then like you, they may be like, oh, it's because it's untranslatable and it's like shut 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 up. But I never found this to necessarily be a problem. When I first read it, I didn't have the online resources that are here now that are just like, I don't want, not a dictionary, but the translation guides. And I remember when I first read it in high school, I just skipped all of it. I was like, okay, whatever. And then later on in college, I defined everything. I went into the back of the crossing and all the pretty horses and then wrote out every definition. I wish I still had that version, but some ex, some ex-girlfriend of mine sucked it into the black hole that she was. And it was never seen again. It's probably at some used bookstore that she sold it back to to go buy some more dark narcissistic matter to, you know, inject into her veins and cause tear on the earth. But what I think Cormac McCarthy is actually asking us to do with all these Spanish translations is to maybe think, why don't we know Spanish? As someone who lives in the American Southwest or even in America now with all the fluctuation of immigrants and everything that's happening, there's almost... And, you know, this may be controversial, I understand, but Mexico is our neighbor. Just how if you live in Germany, France is your neighbor. And you may have a problem with all the immigration or whatever that's been going on or has gone in, on in the past. But you learn the language because there's a different culture right next to you. Me Mexico has a beautiful culture. If you go to especially like southern Mexico to uh, Oaxaca and, and, and that beautiful city and that whole beautiful region and the beaches down there, like so much culture. I mean, I understand. And, and you know. I understand people are scared of the cartels, but as someone who lives 25 minutes from the border and has driven into Mexico, northern Mexico, where things are rough, where things are really bad, countless times, I can report to you guys that it's all just, a lot of it's overblown. And when you hear about some tourists or something getting killed, thinking about all the other people that get Captain um, America all the time, but we just don't hear about it because it's in America and it's just another typical murder. Anyway, I think he, because he learned Spanish um, while he was living in El Paso. He deemed it necessary that he was living here and it was an important thing to do. And as I was saying earlier, I think Americans have this sort of pride and look down on Mexico because, you know, Microsoft has a larger GDP than Mexico. 
and because they have problems with the cartels, which is actually our fault, not their fault, because of our overuse of drugs and all the rich people in America or non-rich people in America who are using drugs. And obviously a market has to get created because we have a deep law enforcement. It's going to get created somewhere else where they don't have the money or the means to create that law enforcement and where corruption and stuff can happen when the big dollars are on the line. And so they haven't had the time or space to grow and develop um because we put our drug problem and the creation of it and the movement of it on them. And then, you know, people just, you know, get it from some random dealer and, be, and you know, get to be, go and party with it. But deal with none of the ramifications or consequences that everyone else along the line had to deal with. And when we look at the numbers in America, it's a little bit skewed because 20% of, of Americans are bilingual, but only but almost all of that are people who speak Spanish, people who move from Mexico, not, and so, you know, there we go. But 30% of people in Europe speak two languages or more, and that number actually may be higher. So, like, that's a pretty big number. But having said all that, I feel like James Elroy really is a little bit off point with these critiques. I wish we got a little bit more from him, but I think it's funny that Cormac McCarthy is kind of what turned him off modern fiction forever, and I heard a recent interview with him and he's still not reading fiction which imagine you know here i am always saying you need to imitate you need to read to be good but that's not necessarily true especially if you're in the genre writing fields because like i said you look at that sentence i just showed you from elroy you guys could write that the a person out there who um has never written anything before if you just trained you know just wrote for a couple months like you, you could write something like that right now and you could write something like that and implement it in a story and do things of that quality not too long from now but what makes James Elroy great is that he understands things like plot and mood and characterization and, you know, building this kind of world and connecting it to his other books. And so that's what makes him good. And and once you kind of learn the framework, once you learn the rules of like how plot works, how to move characters, how to do these types of things, then if you don't really care about your sentence structure and like the literary style game, then you could just give it up. You don't need to read. The only reason that you need to read is to kind of receive that inspiration and have a lot to look to. Because when you look at someone like Cormac McCarthy, he would, you know, he would be writing and be like, wait. Tim O'Brien said the word felic one time, and I want to describe the sandstone as felic, so I need to go back there and look at this. And he would have this huge whole catalog in his brain and probably was taking notes in these books or had a notebook of like words that he liked. And um, that's probably how he developed you know, this crazy vocabulary because he would see it in different words or see it in the OED. And then he would specifically practice and like spend years on these sentences. But looking at Elroy's publishing schedule, unless he's working 16 hours a day, I, you know, you can automatically assume that he's spending not that much time like um, microwing sentences. So if you guys like this video, I have a Cormac McCarthy playlist down below that already has over 150 videos on it. I would love if you subscribed and watched some more videos. Left your thoughts down in the comments, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.